252. Counter Counterculture. Calcedon Report, number 86. October 1972. Herman Kahn, director of the Hudson Institute, recently predicted that the counter counterculture will dominate the next decade. There is, he holds, a growing reaction against the moods and ideas which dominated the 1960s. The pendulum has swung too far. We've abandoned too many traditional values and we haven't replaced them with satisfactory new values. He believes that the upper middle class, the communications people, educators and students and city planners are all basically out of touch with reality. Crime in the streets has aroused anger in the great majority of Americans. He holds that 67% of America is quite square and getting squarer, and that this is the biggest thing going in America today, and it will either dominate or heavily influence the next decade or two. Khan favours this trend and adds, I have a strong desire to give life a kind of meaning and purpose that can only come out of revealed religion. He regrets that he cannot believe in a revealed truth, but he insists that there is meaning to life. Kant criticises the claims that the United States is a racist society and adds, No one has ever shown any good results from busing. Herman Kahn, The Squaring of America, an interview by Jonathan Ward in Intellectual Digest, 3, number 1, September 1972, pages 16 to 19. Kant's opinions usually carry weight and, without agreeing with him, we should give attention to his statements. Others have given similar reports. Furlong has called attention to the fact that, whereas in the 1960s it was the alienated students on college campuses who dominated the scene, today it is increasingly the alienated working man and middle-class citizen of our cities. These people are angry at what has happened to their neighbourhoods. They resent higher taxes, busing, corrupt politics, crime and senseless change for change's sake. They are ready to make peace with law-abiding blacks, and are doing so, to fight against politicians and bureaucrats. Such people are not trying to change the system, so much as they are trying to change the politicians who exploit it. These people are the, quote, non-mobiles, end quote, the people who do not move but remain in a fixed neighbourhood. The white, ethnic, blue-collar workers generally remained non-mobile through these years, after World War II, often living in well-defined pockets of the inner city. William Barry Furlong, Profile of an Alienated Voter, Saturday Review, July 29th, 1972, pages 48 to 51. A similar protest has developed to a degree among many middle-class and upper-middle-class men. Companies who used to move men freely across country and to promote only by moving are now beginning to cut down on this process. Too many good men now refuse to move and resent the rootlessness which has marked executive and professional life since World War II. There is thus a markedly different mood now than that which marked the years from World War II to circa 1970. It is conservatism of a sort, and more than a few have welcomed it as a sign of great changes ahead of a happier kind than those of recent years. Are they right? But, before answering that question, let us examine a very important area of the new conservatism, one which is intense in its criticism of, quote, big government, end quote, of ideas of a scientific elite controlling man and society, of a growing bureaucracy and much more. This sector of the new conservatism is the growing number of, quote, men's magazines, end quote, which emphasise nudity, free love and a laissez-faire attitude towards sexuality, that is, the abolition of all laws governing sexual conduct. Less well known to many is the fact that these publications carry this laissez-faire attitude into other areas. Joe Goldberg, in his study Big Bunny, The Inside Story of Playboy, New York, New York, Ballantyne, 1967, called attention to the fact that one of U. M. Hefner's favourite authors is Ian Rand, page 64. Playboy accordingly manifests a continuing critique of strong civil government and a hostility to statism. Other magazines of the same general nature are equally vocal in their critique of statism and scientism. Thus, 
Al Goldstein has called Various Federal Acts and B.F. Skinner's book Beyond Freedom and Dignity an outrage against the soul. Goldstein sees 1984 and Orwell's nightmare looming ahead and speaks of the, quote, outrage, end quote, of status controls over man. The Senate Finance Committee voted to require that all children entering the first grade after January 1, 1974, be assigned social security numbers. The rationale for this dictator's dream is that of combating welfare cheaters, since jubilating numbers would be ended. Under the present law, a person normally obtains a number when he is first employed. Since FBI dossiers are increasing in number and scope for each and every American, it seems only reasonable that Big Brother now wants to poke his nose into the kindergartens and diapers of our youth. Al Goldstein, The Garbage Peel, Outrage Against the Soul, Cavalier, 22, number 10, August 1972, pages 6-10. to 10. This is not an isolated example. The hostility to and sense of outrage over statism and scientism is very strong in such circles, and it appears on both sides of the Iron Curtain. A quote, fantastic tale, end quote, by Vlas Tenen, Moscow Nights, a product of Russian underground literature, reflects the feeling of pornographic bitterness in intellectual circles in the Soviet Union for statism and scientism. A song sung by the youth of the underground is savage in its hatred of scientific socialist planning, which aims at playing God, seeking to make figs grow among Eskimos and snow to fall in the Sahara, according to the song. The song also says, Those bastard scientists, just for a bet, have turned the whole world on its head. Whether it's rabbits they deal with or man, the scientists couldn't give a damn. Last Tenen, Moscow Nights, New York, New York, Olympia, 1971, page 80. It would be easy to pile up data and make a case for Herman Kahn's belief that we are moving into a counter-counterculture. In fact, some might call it a counter-revolutionary mood. Even some of the Black Panther leaders have of late rejected revolutionary action in favour of legal process. The important point is this. Is there anything in this new conservatism which offers hope for the future? We must remember that, the closer Rome drew to its collapse, the more it reeled against the tightening noose of statist power, looked nostalgically to the past and blundered ahead to its death. This new conservatism is very heavily marked by a neo-anarchism, so that its very conservatism is, in essence, a radicalism. The new conservatism wants all the benefits which the state provides, but not the state itself, an impossible picture. It wants a strong state to enforce its particular interests, such as ecological controls, welfareism, anti-racist legislation, and much more. But it wants a laissez-faire attitude with respect to sexual regulations, neighbourhood schools and busing, privacy, and much more. To create a powerful state in certain areas of life means to create a powerful state which will not stay out of other areas. A power state which has the power of life and death over industry will exercise the same power over the little people of the country, whose ability to withstand civil power is much less than that of, quote, big business, end quote. The stronger man makes the state, the weaker he makes himself. Thus, the new conservatism is very much a meaningless protest. Lacking a consistent philosophy, it can only win battles, never a war. It may succeed in its middle class and working man's forms in stopping busing, although even this is dubious, and it may stop a few other things, but it will not check the growth of statist power. In its neo-anarchistic forms, this neoconservatism may gain far more drastic abolition of sexual regulations and it may win some victories for personal privacy, but it is also increasing status controls by some of its other demands. An even more serious weakness marks the new conservatism. The older conservatism, still present in the middle class, was marked by serious weaknesses and a divorce from its Christian roots. It had, however, this virtue. It was still production-oriented. 
The very deadly flaw of the new conservatism is that it is consumption-oriented. A fact seldom appreciated is that, in most decadent and dying societies, there is a strong nostalgia for the past and a rootless and sentimental conservatism. The faith that made the long-for past is dead, but the longing for its fruits is widespread. Today, for example, the Puritanism of early America, its strong belief in the sovereignty of God, its emphasis on God's law, and its insistence on godly order are all gone. But the antiquarian interest in early America is at an all-time high. Antiques command a growing price. Early Americana of all kinds is prized. Books in America sell at a rapid pace, and interest in the past has spread to Indian culture, early French American culture, and early Spanish American culture. A similar nostalgia for and interest in the past is common to Europe. This interest, however, is a part of the problem. It is a part of the consumption oriented mentality which wants to enjoy the best of the past, present and future to consume and to enjoy, rather than to produce. Friedrich Heer, in The Medieval World, 1962, writes of the, quote, open Europe, end quote, of 1100. Men travelled freely from England through Russia, from Europe to Byzantium, and from Europe to the Islamic world. Trade routes were well travelled, and intermarriages were common. Even in Spain, despite the combat, marriages between Islamic, Jewish and Hispano-Christian families, especially among the aristocracy and merchant classes, were common. In addition to the commercial travel, there was a great deal of movement across frontiers by pilgrims. Commercial travel is still very much with us, but pilgrims have been replaced by tourists, a significant fact. The pilgrim was moved by a strong faith and a vision of the kingdom of God on earth, the tourist is concerned with seeing the past before it disappears. The tourist sees greatness in the past. The pilgrim sees it in the past in order to establish it in the present and the future. A consumption-oriented conservatism thus looks to the past, builds museums, establishes national forests, and works to conserve a heritage in its outward forms. It often accomplishes worthwhile goals in its nostalgia. Winning some battles, it loses the war, because it sees no greatness ahead for man, only disaster. A production-oriented conservatism will not neglect the past, but it will regard today and tomorrow as man's best opportunity and his truest hope. The older, middle-class conservatism is still with us, and it is still production-oriented, but, having lost its Christian moorings, it has become rootless, and it has drifted into alien waters. Moreover, as a result of its humanism, it has picked up three ideas, which are the essence of socialism in its every form. Increasingly, conservatives are ready to accept one or more of these premises, and, in all too many cases, all three. These three ideas are, first, a belief in the conflict of interests. Instead of holding that, basic to reality is God's sovereign government and law, and an overriding, governing and ultimate harmony of all interests, Most conservatives accept dialectical, existential, pragmatic or Hegelian philosophies with their principle of a conflict of interests. The theory of evolution makes conflict and the struggle for survival the basic aspect of biological reality. As a result, the philosophy of a conflict of interests, the economic form of which is the doctrine of class struggle, saturates both left and right. Second, both Marxists and many, quote, conservatives, end quote, are agreed in the belief in a capitalist conspiracy behind all events, and some leftist periodicals are beginning to praise, quote, conservative, end quote, literature on this subject. Third, Lenin called the acceptance of status central banking and a paper currency, quote, nine-tenths, end quote, of socialism. All too many, quote, conservatives, end quote, are ready to demand both of these things as their hope. The, quote, funny money, end quote, advocates are as, quote, conservative, end quote, as Lenin. Philosophically and religiously, most conservatism is bankrupt and intellectually in contradiction to itself. Morally, too, there is a bleak outlook for the, quote, counter-counterculture, end quote. 
The amount of shoplifting today is an important factor in the price of many items. But great as this shoplifting is, the amount of theft by officials and employees in any business or shop is far greater. In many areas, theft adds more to the price of goods than to taxes. The most difficult part of any business today is very often the finding of honest employees. There is nothing modest about the stealing. One businessman recently stated that he discovered, in tracing only a portion of his losses by theft, that the daily profit to only a few employees was far greater than that of himself and his partner. Thefts, in fact, were endangering his survival, and his situation was no worse than that of many other businessmen, and even better. The moral collapse apparent in all classes is very grave and very deep. Robert N. Winterberger in The Washington Payoff, 1972, gives a telling account, as a former lobbyist, of corruption in Washington, D.C. He is naive in believing that knowledge of these facts will arouse the country and save the nation. The corruption in Washington, and in capitals all over the world, is a corruption which reflects the life and morality of the people. Knowledge of these facts has no long-term effect. Men are not saved by knowledge, but by the grace of God. It is not knowledge of corruption, or of conspiracies, or of evil, which will revitalise man and society, but a knowledge of God's grace and his law word. The, quote, counter-counterculture is a futile thing. It longs for the past when it should be building for the future. Man is in trouble, and the humanistic state is in trouble also. God is not in trouble, nor are we, if we stand in terms of his government and law word. Choose you this day whom you will serve, Joshua chapter 24 verse 15. Your life depends on it, 